Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ministers. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to reflect on the uh, terrible news today about the earthquake that has struck and caused devastation in central Italy. Uh, the Honourable Professor Antimo Cesaro, Italy's Under Secretary of State and the Minister of Cultural Heritage, Antiquities and Tourism, is representing the country here at the summit, as is Carlo Perotta, the Italian Consul General here in Edinburgh. I know all of us here today, in the spirit of this summit, which brings us all together, will want to say that our sympathies and thoughts are with you and the people of Italy who have been affected by this tragedy. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ken McIntosh, MSP, and as presiding officer, it's my pleasure, I'm delighted and honoured to be welcome you to the Scottish Parliament and to the 2016 Edinburgh International Culture Summit. I hope you enjoy and take inspiration from your surroundings this week. This beautiful building was designed by Spanish architect Enrique Morales, drawing on the Scottish landscape, the flower paintings of Charles Rennie Macintosh and the upturned fishing boats, still to be seen along our uh, vast and occasionally spectacular coastline. The Parliament building itself has become a cultural icon here in Scotland, and as he developed the design, Morales said that it was a building growing out of the land. His architecture and the Parliament itself in turn provoked our national poet, the then Scots Macar Edwin Morgan, to write the poem Open the Doors, which took the same theme and extended it by linking it to the people of the land and how our doors must be open to those people. I therefore hope you agree that it is a fitting venue for you and for all our guests from around the world to gather and to explore the unique role that arts and culture plays as a form of exchange to build trust between people, cultures and nations. Thomas Carlyle, a Scottish philosopher from the Enlightenment era, said, culture is the process by which a person becomes all that they were created capable of being. And you don't need me to tell you that culture has the potential to be a force for positive change and to make a huge economic impact. All you have to do is walk down this city's Royal Mile right now to witness the positive impact of Edinburgh's festivals. Culture is essential to our sense of well-being and our self-worth. It is often what defines us as nations and as individuals within those nations. It is at the very core of who we are and what we do. Mahatma Gandhi famously said, a nation's culture resides in the heart and in the soul of its people. And here in the Scottish Parliament, we try to play our part in promoting and supporting culture. At the moment, we have a fantastic photographic exhibition by Scotland's own Harry Benson CBE. The exhibition includes photographs of every US president from Eisenhower to Obama, including, I may add, pictures of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. It also includes extensive images of the civil rights movement in America, 1960s and 1970s public protests for women's rights and both for and against the war in Vietnam. And when you come into the building, uh, just outside the entrance, you may have glimpsed the Kelpie's maquettes. These are steel structures, steel sculptures of horses' heads, handcrafted by renowned Scottish sculptor uh, Andy Scott. They were made as models of the world's largest equine sculptures, the Kelpies, a 300-ton public artwork located in the Helix Park in the Falkirk area of Scotland. The Kelpies are monuments to the significance of the Clydesdale horses to that area and to the lost industries that once thrived there. So we are conscious of the positive role that the Scottish Parliament can play. But I'm also conscious of the interaction between politics and culture. Governments often do what they can to support the arts, but however beneficial, however vital we believe music, sculpture and literature to be, it is difficult to compete for resources with other vital public services. However positive culture can be as a force for good for our sense of identity and mutual understanding, it can also be divisive, a symbol of national oppression, or as we are seeing with the current trial for the cultural damage wrought in Timbuktu, a target for opponents. Now, the overarching theme of this year's summit is culture, building resilient communities. So we very much want to focus on the positive, reflecting the summit's belief 
in the capacity of the arts and culture to foster common bonds between nations, states and cities. To achieve this over the next few days, we will focus on three interlinked policy strands, culture and heritage, culture and economics, and culture and participation. In between, I hope you will make the most of the celebration of arts that is Edinburgh in August and take advantage of new opportunities for cultural exchanges, collaborations and friendships. Once again, welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I do hope you have a very productive, but more importantly, a very enjoyable time here. Thank you. I now welcome, I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs, Fiona Hislop, MSP, to welcome participants and guests to Summit 2016 on behalf of the Scottish Government. Fiona Hislop. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, ministers, ambassadors, uh, the last time that I was in this chamber was in July, uh, when the Queen formally opened the fifth session of the Scottish Parliament. And that opening ceremony was in some ways more cultural a uh, celebration than a political occasion. We had some wonderful performances by the National Youth Choir of Scotland, our Royal Scottish National Orchestra, Ensemble, and the Scottish Youth Theatre. And for me, one of the highlights was the reading of a new poem by Jackie Kay, Scotland's Macker, our national poet, and she will perform it at the opening dinner later this evening. And I think that the importance that the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government attaches to culture, something which was so obvious from that opening ceremony in July, says something important about modern Scotland. We're a nation which cherishes culture. And if you get a chance to read the quotations carved into the cannon gate wall of this parliament, uh, the building, just, uh, the building uh, on the wall just on the Royal Mile, you'll see that poetry is literally built into the bricks of the national parliament. And we are proud of the great writers and artists of our past, and we're proud of the vibrancy, the diversity, and the excellence of our contemporaries art scene. And you will all get a chance to experience that vibrancy, that diversity, and that excellence in the days ahead. In August, Edinburgh hosts the largest celebration of the arts anywhere on the planet. In the Fringe and International Festival alone, there are more than 50,000 performances of more than 3,000 shows from 48 countries. And throughout the year, the audience figures of all 12 of Edinburgh's festivals total more than 4.5 million people, the equivalent of a World Cup, but we get that every single year. And the festivals are wonderful in their own right. And in Edinburgh right now, you can sense the energy, the excitement on virtually every street corner. And they also speak deeply to Scotland's uh, enduring sense of internationalism. They showcase the best of Scotland to the world and they enable us to experience the best of international culture. And that sense of internationalism is valuable at all times. It's been part of the purpose of the Edinburgh International Festival ever since it was established in 1947 in the wake of World War II. And of course, it feels hugely important now when the UK, despite Scotland's vote to remain, is set to leave the European Union. And we are more determined than ever to show that we remain a welcoming and an inclusive society. And so the festivals aren't just a fantastic celebration of art in all its forms. They also demonstrate, celebrate, and strengthen a sense of internationalism that we hold dear. And that internationalism is why, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I helped establish this International Culture Summit with our key partners in 2012, and why we've held further summits in 2014 and now in 2016.
And I'm very grateful to you, presiding officer, and your parliamentary colleagues for their help in organising the event. And I also want to thank the Scottish Government's other partners. You will hear in a moment from Matt Hancock, the UK Government's Minister of State for Digital and Culture. The British Council and the Edinburgh International Festival have also been very important partners right from the start. And I want to thank all of them for their efforts in bringing all of you and the world you bring with you here. Most of all, though, I want to give my thanks to you for all coming to Edinburgh and to Scotland. I referred earlier to the Jackie Pake poem Threshold, which she will perform later this evening. And it ends with these lines, which are repeated in a number of different languages. It takes more than one language to tell a story. Welcome. One language is never enough. And the 41 delegations here today bring to the summit a multitude of languages, of stories, and of experiences. And my hope is that by sharing just some of them, we can learn a huge amount from each other. We can generate ideas, gain insights, and make connections. And by doing that, we can help each other in our shared mission to celebrate the arts, promote international understanding, and ensure that culture enriches and acts as a bridge between the lives of all peoples. So welcome. I'm sure that you will uh, enjoy the summit. I hope it's productive. And above all, I hope you have a wonderful time while you're here in Scotland. Enjoy each other's company, enjoy our city, and enjoy what we all can bring to the world together. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And now, uh, to welcome guests and participants on behalf of the UK Government, I call on Right Honourable Matt Peacock, MP, Minister for Culture, Digital, uh, Digital and Culture at the Ministry of Culture. Mr Hancock. Thank you very much. And from the UK Government, from the heart of Edinburgh, I welcome all participants to this summit. Can I thank you, Fiona, for the work that you've done over the past few years in establishing this summit. Also, Sir Kieran and the work of the British Council, and Sir Jonathan Mills, who has worked so hard to make these summits a success. We come here in a wonderful month for the city of Edinburgh, which I think anybody who comes can see as a, an exciting city, a proudly Scottish city, a British city, and perhaps most of all, a global city, with the 12 festivals demonstrating to the world the creative impetus that we have here in this city and in this country. For centuries, Edinburgh has sent out around the world, those at the cutting edge of culture, innovation, and exploration, from Thomas Carlyle, Alexander Graham Bell, and a multitude of others. And this is important for two reasons. The first is the economic. The creative industries here in the UK are responsible for over four million jobs, over 200 billion of value, and one of the most rapidly growing parts of our economy. They employ people of all ages, and I think that at this summit it is um, relevant to welcome the younger participants who are playing such a central role. But this economic value is not all, and in fact it is perhaps not as important as the social and the human. Britain is an outward optimistic country, engaged and open to the world, and it is within that spirit that we welcome you all here. And the task now is to make sure that we use the arts and culture to demonstrate the social glue, that which binds us together, domestically to spread culture and access to culture to all parts, not just the heights of London and Edinburgh, not just to the affluent, but to all. 
building the strength of communities and building that social glue. And it's not just about culture within one country because culture transcends borders. Globally, to shape, as it has done in the past, Britain's role in the world and identity. To bind humanity in mutual understanding and appreciation. Where we celebrate that which brings us together and not concentrate on that which divides us. Let that be the spirit of this summit and let us work to promote that spirit here in Edinburgh and the world over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, Mr Hancock. Uh, I'd like to update the summit now on a slight change to the programme. I have the real pleasure of inviting Yusuf Nadur to address the summit. Yusuf Nadur is the former Minister of Culture, Senegal, and we as well as a world-renowned uh, musician. He has collaborated with artists as diverse as Branford Marsalis, Tracy Chapman, Ryuchi Sakamoto, Lou Reed, Peter Gabriel, Sting and Bruce Springsteen. And in order to facilitate Yusuf Nadur's vast experience and knowledge, he will address you in French and the format of his address will be an interview. So I'm delighted to welcome Emmanuel Cochet, Consul General for France, who will ask Yusuf Nadur questions in French and the conversation will be translated simultaneously so for those of you who require, I would suggest you put your headsets on now. Thank you, Yusuf Nadur and Emmanuel Koshi. Famous and widely acclaimed international musician, and at the same time, um, a politician, a senior politician, with still senior positions in your country, Senegal. So we'll conduct this, this conversation in, in French. So, before this cultural summit, what's your message on culture and its relationship uh, to politics? Especially from your perspective as a politician in your own right. You're probably the only person who's uh, exercised high office in both politics and culture. And perhaps even above and beyond your own, your own artistic exercises, you've taken an important role in culture. And you're now in politics in your own pays, so you so. Uh, thank you very much for facilitating this meeting. It's a great honour for me to share with everyone who's here. I think it's incredibly fortunate to have this discussion about culture because it presents advantages for our own lives for, and for the cultural economy itself. So I want to describe economy and culture as train rails. Without the rails, the train doesn't work. And of course we need content, cultural content we also need to be economically supported. So for the train to work, we need both rails. We need the first rail, which is the cultural content, and the other rail is the, the economics of culture. Emmanuel says that already brings us into a need to get involved in culture, uh, to have commitment towards promoting culture. So, how, how does culture contribute to development when we have these two rails? Usu says, we could see culture as an advantage. It's a, it's a, it riches in its own right, it's not an obstacle. There are many continents and countries that are beginning to close in on themselves. but we need to understand that the, the, the world is enriched when we get involved in culture. And of course we need to, to thank all of the entre entrepreneurs and philanthropists who have supported cultures, who have supported culture and have really contributed to the cultures that we have today. 
having the economic means to get involved in culture is important. So we need to get involved in, in looking after and supporting culture. So we can't really get out, away from the economic importance of, of supporting culture. Emmanuel says, you're from Senegal and has a real cultural industry and it's a real co a cultural industry which is having a major effect on the country. And we can really talk about an, in an industrial impact. How did that happen? Yusu says, as, as Minister for Culture, I find that, that there were a lot of things missing in the country. And a lot of things that were impacting on the major cultural actors. Because if these cultural creators are in extreme poverty, they can't create. And if they can't create anymore, it's a catastrophe. Maybe it's not obvious and you can't see it, but you can feel it. And I believe that we need to work for reforms. We need to work for reforms that, are re that really allow cultural actors to live their lives, to live stably, so that we can contribute to their creations too. Emmanuel says, we've seen a, an economic impact, a, an impact that goes beyond borders. And so the, the great promoters of African music are known around the world now. What's the root of your success? as an exporter, as an ambassador in your own right. Yusuf says, it's all about get, driving the roots down deep. That brings together who I am, what I have, what I do, and opens me up to others. And so what we call the explosion of the musical world It is in that explosion we understand that that people have to be able to see that everything I'm doing is coming from me. And Emmanuel says, and so this internationalization of which is rooted in 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 specific countries. And what made that difficult? Yusuf says that the more we open up, we think that when we open up we're going to lose something, but actually we gain we come closer. And Emmanuel talks about, in terms of talented people moving around, what impact does that have on today's uh, cultural economics? How do you convince people to stay connected to their, the country that they've come from when there are so many opportunities at, abroad and, and people, talented people can travel? Yusuf says, I think I, I was speaking about cooperation with France earlier. And this cooperation allows cultural actors to, to move around. That gives them the opportunity to, to move around, to travel. And I can talk to you about the, the difficulty of traveling as an artist. It makes life difficult to come he here to, to Britain. You need to give them your passport. You need to wait three weeks for a visa. And you, you still don't know if you're going to get a visa. And, if, and that's just if you want to come here to talk about culture. With other countries, it's the same. There are measures that we bring in because of security. But that doesn't do cultural actors any good. Emmanuel is taught. So we can talk about uh, cultural actors being able to, to travel, but what about capital being able to, to travel, to go beyond borders? Yusuf says, I think investment needs to grow. And, and that's where parliaments come into to play, where decision making comes into play. If we 
lose our, our feeling, our meaning of our existence, I think that we lose everything. We lose what we want to do, even what we are now, what we want to be. And so we end up having to ask the United Nations And forums like the one that we have here at Edinburgh are very rare in allowing us to talk to all of the people involved in decision making. Manuel says, you've talked about choice, about difficult choices that have to be made in politics and in economics. What's your, what do you think are the best arguments to convince people to invest in, in culture when people have differing priorities? And different governments have different pressures on them. Yusuf says, you need to see it as an investment. When we talk about uh, balancing budgets, we need to see cultural actors as people who can... as people who can change... When I was co Minister for Culture, I wasn't there to convince people. I was there to invest in people. So when we're talking about budgets, we, we need to, to talk about and getting people rooted and grounded in their own country and, and talk about investing in cultural actors. So I, th I think we need to look at reforms. We need to begin to model cultural politics to show people the, the economic importance of culture and how culture and economics are two rails that we, where we need both. Emmanuel says we're talking about education and the, the priorities of economics and culture. How does culture come into education? Yusa says we need to see education as, as the, the basic level. If we leave culture out of education, we end up losing culture. If in our countries, our working language is one that only came in because of colonization, and in our houses, and we speak other languages, that shows us that we need to do something. And I think education is the basis of everything. So Manuel says, so that's a, a question of di linguistic diversity and cultural diversity. And are, are you in favour of preserving that diversity? Yusu says that's not happening everywhere. And in, in Scotland, it's the same thing as in England, I think. In Scotland, children are born and they know one language. In our country, you, you speak one language to your mum, but at seven years old, you're going to school and you're going to learn another language so that you can even work. So right from the start, there's a balancing act to be done across the, the entire scope of society. So people who are in charge of governments they need to do something really special in education. So there are some areas that have more possibilities than others. So here, children are born, they speak English, and they, they work in English. In Senegal, you, you speak Wolof at home and you work in French. And you see why it's difficult. Emmanuel, t in terms of sustainable and the sustainable impact of culture, what can you say are the priorities today uh, on the international level? Yusu says reforms are absolutely the priority. At the highest level that we can go, we need to be thinking about reform. We need to get rid of debts. We saw everyone campaigning to get rid of debts for the year 2000, and that was good. And we tried lots and lots of things to get there. 
and we, we saw lots of work to get to try and reduce AIDS and to reduce other diseases as well. So now we need to start setting up arguments. We need to keep arguing and be there to speak about the importance of culture and education, of course. And Emmanuel, and so this evening, you're going to see the, the, the largest concert hall in Edinburgh. And so we would like to wish you a, a lovely stay in Scotland and thank you for your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yusin Adur and Emmanuel Koshi. And now to those from far afield, and perhaps as a reminder to those from Scotland, uh, here now is a flavour of uh, Scotland's proud history and heritage. Please welcome one of our finest actresses, Beth Marshall, to read the final speech from James III, The True Mirror, the third of the James Plays trilogy by Rona Munro. Now this outstanding trilogy charts Scotland's history over the reigns of James I, James II and James III from 1406 to 1488. These plays, commissioned by Edinburgh International Festival and National Theatre Scotland, were first performed at the Edinburgh International Festival in 2014. Beth, over to you. Well, if you've all finished having hysterics, can someone remind me what we're supposed to be doing here? What was it again? Oh, yes. Ruling Scotland. In fact, I think we just heard your king giving you specific instructions to get on and do that job any way you liked. So, this is your plan, is it? To stand here howling obscenities. Is anyone going to attempt any parliamentary business or will we have another shouting match? It's time to do the job you came for. You may not have a king, but you have a queen. I have the king's trust. I can take the king's place. And you think I would like that? Like it? Have you blown your nose and lost your brain? Who would want the job of ruling Scotland? I'm Danish, you ignorant, abusive lumps of manure. I come from a rational nation of reasonable people. You know the problem with you lot? You've got fuck all except attitude. You scream and shout about how you want things done and how things ought to be done. And when the chance comes, look at you. What are you frightened of? Making things worse? Well, according to you, things can't get worse for Scotland. Oh, you wear me out, do you know that? You, you drive me mad. Would one of you please tell me why it is I still love you so much? Would someone please explain why a rational woman born in a reasonable country would rather live here and be your queen than live in happy, quiet peace anywhere else on earth? I'm the Queen of Scots, and no, I don't always like that. But I do love it, always. I was 12 years old when I came here. I didn't understand a word anyone said to me. I was frightened. I was lonely. I, I had no friends this side of the North Sea. But you talked slowly until I understood you showed me that the more frightened you are, the better the joke you can tell about it. You showed me you can find friends anywhere you share food and drink if you just wait and see how to join in the conversation. By the time I was 13, this was my home. You let me be. You let me grow. You taught me who I am. I am the Queen of Scots. <laughs> Will I show you how well I learned that lesson? 
These are yours. All this is yours. The comfort of community is warmer and softer than cold gold could ever be. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to understand that. To understand how to be your queen. <laughs> I'm sorry I never told you any of this. I, I should have known that the only way to let you understand how much I care was to tell you exactly what I think of you. I've seen the worst of you and your murderous, miserable men. And you've seen the worst of me. I've been a proud, overdressed, self-centered woman. But the best in you pulls me above that. And the best in you, with my help, can sustain this parliament and this nation. I give you my jewels. I, I give you myself. I give you all I know. I wasn't even born here, but I am offering Scotland my life. I'm your queen. I'm still here. Look at me. Am I not the Queen of Scots? Will you help me unite this country in peace? Will you help me make Scotland's law? Will you let me do all I can in her name? Will you help me rule? Then tomorrow, we can begin. Together, you and I will govern Scotland. Thank you, Beth. That was wonderful. Even the unparliamentary language. <laughs> now my colleagues are listening. Can I now invite Sir Jonathan Mills to the floor to introduce the 2016 Summit Programme. He has been Director of various festivals in Australia and more recently here in Edinburgh. In addition to his role as Visiting Professor at the University of Edinburgh, he is our Programme Director for the Summit. Sir Jonathan. Thank you. Um, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, May I add my warm welcome to those of the presiding officer of this parliament, um, the cabinet secretary and the minister of state. The theme of the summit this year, culture building resilient communities, reflects a strong belief in the vital role that culture plays in the life of any successful community. I believe that culture is a prism through which to perceive the equilibrium of any society. The stories we tell about ourselves, reflect our ambitions and values, and have an inestimable impact on the cohesiveness and the liveliness of the world we seek to create. I make this claim whilst at the same time acknowledging that how one defines success is quite often a matter of cultural, environmental, and linguistic difference. Human societies are by their very nature and origins extremely complicated, often contradictory entities. They are quite simply as paradoxical as each and every one of us here today, hard to fathom, almost impossible to define. When the then president of Timor-Leste, Janana Gujmao, addressed this summit in 2012, he declared that having returned from years of exile and just been elected the first president of East Timor, in contemplating a future for his young nation, it was not viable or desirable to build a country sector by sector in a piecemeal way, a bit at a time, by focusing on transport before education, health before habitation. He saw that his role was to do something much more fundamental, to build a community where none existed. After years of war and conflict, there was an imperative to foster a sense of purpose and personal commitment within society, to encourage people to have a sense of pride in their community, to nurture a spirit of goodwill and optimism, while at the same time building roads, schools, hospitals, and houses. Without confidence and hope, nothing could change and nothing was likely to endure. But as a poet, 
Janana perceived that an essential and rather direct route to achieving that confidence and optimism might be found in the traces of one's art, painting and sculpture, the pulses of dance and music, the spectacle of opera, the fantasy of poetry, and the conflicts of drama, and within, indeed, the rituals of one's own spiritual beliefs. In his groundbreaking study, Making Democracy Work, the eminent political scientist Robert Putnam put it another way when he said, civil society creates wealth. Wealth does not create a civil society. The Edinburgh International Cultural Summit is hosted by a city in which for almost 70 years, cultural relationships of a most diverse and intense kind have been initiated and nurtured. The decision to hold the summit in August during the Edinburgh International Festival extends to you all the opportunity to engage directly with one of the most diverse and vibrant cultural celebrations in the world. And as much as it is a Scottish initiative, it offers a genuinely international perspective, and I encourage you to embrace it as your festival, not just ours. Your presence is indeed an encouragement to the almost 25,000 artists from over 70 nations who gather in this city every year to participate in these festivals. The summit invites you to contribute to a wide-ranging conversation across three interlinked topics to consider the urgent social and political priorities of protecting and preserving environments of outstanding culture and heritage importance for all of humanity and throughout the entire world, to compare some of the economic um, opportunities and challenges facing a range of governments in a variety of financial circumstances and political contexts, and to recognize the best ways to ensure the greatest possible participation in cultural activities by all manner of citizens, young, old, directly and in person, or via digital platforms. And surely the idea, the very idea of participation, touches the core of the rights and responsibilities of individuals and communities throughout the world. It is the right to be engaged, it is the opportunity to connect, and it is the pleasure of participation. In devising a program for the summit, I'm keen to cultivate a balance of voices representing multiple perspectives rather than a singular attitude, recommending that no continent no, or particular perspective should dominate these proceedings. And I'm delighted that 41 nations from a very diverse range of parts of the world are represented here in this chamber. In visiting Scotland, you are coming to a place with a strong emphasis on finding practical solutions to the many challenges you face in your professional positions. We believe that by sharing your perspectives openly and honestly, you will create the opportunity for each participant to identify ideas and solutions that you have tried and tested and might be readily adaptable to their own particular context, hopefully with equally positive results. The summit is in two parts, a series of short presentations here in the debating chamber of the Scottish Parliament, these becoming the impetus for longer discussions and debates in which you will participate in private session. On behalf of the summit partners, the British Council, the Edinburgh International Festival, um, the UK government, the Scottish government and the Scottish Parliament, um, I would like to thank Sir Angus Grosset and the trustees of the Summit Foundation, the independent charity established to support the work of the summit. I would like to acknowledge our corporate philanthropic and individual supporters, Aberdeen Asset Management, Bailey Gifford, the Binks Trust, Sir Ewan and Lady Brown, the Dunard Fund, Dundas Global, Edinburgh Partners, Sir Angus and Lady Grosset, Fleur Grosset, and the Morton Charitable Trust. I'd also like to acknowledge the collaborations and contributions of our knowledge partners, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, Edinburgh World Heritage, the Center for Public Diplomacy at the University of Southern California, and WITRAP, the World Heritage Institute of Training and Research for the Asia and the Pacific under the auspices of UNESCO. I am particularly delighted for the, for, the, for the first time this year we are able to host a program for young leaders as part of the summit. 
I would like to thank Creative Scotland, the City of Edinburgh Council, the European Festivals Association and its Festival Academy, the European Youth Forum and the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities for their support of this important initiative. I wish you well in your deliberations during the summit and hope that all of us participating in this year's summit will leave here with a renewed enthusiasm to make the case for culture, not merely as a reinforcement of a status quo, but an essential um, enlargement of the circumstances in which we imagine our lives. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Sir Jonathan. Uh, tomorrow we are going to reconvene here for the uh, first of our plenary sessions, and we'll hear three speakers addressing the first of the three, th three themes for Summit 2016 before breaking out for individual policy discussions, and that pattern will be repeated uh, in the afternoon. Uh, but before we break for dinner, I'd like to ask everyone, if we can, to assemble on the floor of the chamber and we're going to take a photograph. So all the delegates here on the floor, I want you all to come down to the front. Oh, hang on a second. Oh, now Andrew's our photographer here. So if, if I can just pass over control to Andrew, who's going to tell us exactly where to stand. And Okay, is that fine? Thank you all very much, and I close this session.